Napoleon is arguably the greatest general in human history, defeating five different coalitions put together to stop him, while becoming master of the continent of Europe. His empire ultimately collapsed after the disastrous Russian invasion in 1812. The story goes that Napoleon invaded Russia in the winter, in the extreme cold ruined his army, leading to its destruction. But is that really the story? Did the Russian winter really bring about the end of Napoleon's reign? In this video, I'm going to explore that myth, and give you the actual story of why Napoleon's Russian invasion failed, and what really caused the end of his empire. Let's start with why. Why did Napoleon invade Russia in the first place? So there are three main triggers for why Napoleon embarked on the Russian invasion, but first, you need a little background info. In 1807, Napoleon defeated Russia in the Battle of Friedland. As a result of that victory, the Treaty of Tilsit was concluded. The key provisions were, number one, France and Russia were now allies agreeing to aid each other in disputes. Number two, Russia would join the continental system. And for joining that system, France would help Russia in their disputes against the Ottomans. Number three, Napoleon guaranteed the sovereignty of the Duchy of Oldenburg and several other smaller states ruled by the Tsar's German relatives. Let's focus on number two real quick. What was the continental system? So to understand that, you must first understand that Napoleon's sworn existential enemy were the British. They were the true thorn in his side. They helped to fund the constant coalitions of nations that were fighting him on the European continent. And on the seas, they took over France's vulnerable colonial possessions. What is most frustrating for Napoleon, though, is that he cannot defeat them, like he has against Russia, Austria, or Prussia. After all, the English Channel separates Great Britain from France, and is protected by Britain's powerful Royal Navy. Napoleon did once try to build a large and powerful fleet so that he could invade the British Islands, but it was smashed by Admiral Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. After that battle, the idea of launching an invasion across the channel is scrapped. Instead, Napoleon will wage an economic war against the British. Essentially, the continental system is an economic blockade. All the nations that Napoleon has mastery over are forced into the system, which bans all trade with Great Britain. Great Britain is the world's most dominant manufacturing and trading empire, so the plan is to take away their resources and markets. Here's an example of how this all works in practice. Let's look at Russia. Russia is an extremely large country with a lot of natural resources, but they have a very limited manufacturing capability. So what they have to do is export all of those raw natural resources to countries like Great Britain, who have the manufacturing capacity to turn those raw materials into finished products. Timber is one of those key resources. Timber is used to make ships, pretty important for a naval power, like Great Britain. But by the 1800s, British forests were low in timber. However, Russia has plenty. And so they develop a deeply connected trading partnership. To showcase just how interconnected they were, here's another example. At the Peace of Ames in 1802, out of the 986 merchant ships that visited Russian ports of St. Petersburg and Kronstadt, 477 were British, while only five were French. That's why Russia joining the continental system was so important to Napoleon. Although joining that system led Russian ports to be stockpiled with raw materials, like grain, hemp, tallow, flax, timber, leather, cattle, and iron that just could not be sold without British merchant vessels. With that, the price of exports fell dramatically, while the price of imports sharply increased. Russian frustration grew even worse in 1810, when the British suffered a very poor harvest, while Russia had a bountiful one. Napoleon permitted, and heavily taxed I might add, the export of grain from French ports to Britain. However, Russia was not allowed to sell any of its harvest to Britain, despite having the lowest prices anywhere on the continent. So why not just replace British markets with French ones? Well, in 1807, France had hoped to do just that. The issue was the war with Britain, which made maritime trade basically impossible. The Royal Navy is very effective at restricting any kind of seaborne trade. What about land trade? The reason countries like oceanic trade, especially back then, but even now, is because it's way cheaper and faster. Ships can transport large amounts of goods significantly faster than using horses or other animals to haul objects across the underdeveloped roads of Eastern Europe. It wasn't just distance that affected the trade. Franco-Russian commercial relations were hurt by a lack of credit in sharply depreciating Russian currency. When Russia joined the continental system, they had a high degree of national and foreign debt. That debt contributed to the paper ruble collapsing in value, made even worse by the government's attempt to cover up the growing deficit by printing more. With the Russian economy heading towards calamity, Tsar Alexander took some measures to stabilize the economy, like in 1810 by reducing the amount of money printed, raising taxes, cutting spending, and restricting the import of luxury items through protective tariffs. He also importantly relaxed restrictions on trading vessels under neutral flags, irregardless of whose goods they carried. This enraged Napoleon, who believed the Spanish, Portuguese, American, Swedish, and even French flags served as a disguise 
for English trade. That all those vessels are actually English, loaded for English commerce with English merchandise. He believed firmly that if Russia just committed to the continental system, Britain would be on its knees in a year. By 1811, Alexander's decree had effectively withdrawn them from the continental system. Let's go back to the Treaty of Tilsit and their terms again. One of the important side effects that came out of it must be mentioned, and that's the creation of the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. This French client state was created out of Prussian land ceded to Napoleon as part of Tilsit. The duchy was then expanded with lands from Austria, after Napoleon defeated the Fifth Coalition in the Battle of Wagram in 1809. Alexander and Russian leaders see this enlarged Polish state as a direct threat to their existence. Throughout Russian history, the land of Poland is always seen as a crucial strategic buffer zone in case of invasion, and they are worried that if another power, like Napoleon's France, has influence there, they can use these same Polish lands as a springboard for an invasion into Russia proper. When Napoleon has the duchy start fortifying its border territory with Russia, that seems to confirm Russian suspicions that Napoleon is trying to reconstitute a large and powerful Polish state on their border. To make matters even more tense, Napoleon was blocking Alexander's ambition of securing the Straits of Dardanelles, wanting to avoid Russian interference into the Mediterranean. And the final insult at Alexander's expense is when Napoleon, in 1810, annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg, which meant that Alexander's own brother-in-law lost his domain, breaking the Treaty of Tilsit in the process. Napoleon did this because the Duke of Oldenburg was violating the continental system, permitting British products to be smuggled into the duchy. Napoleon did, in his own way, try to strengthen the connection between his empire and Russia by offering to marry Alexander's sister, but the Romanovs hated that idea. So Napoleon instead married the daughter of the Austrian emperor. So, for Cliff Notes purposes, the three main reasons that Napoleon ended up at war with Russia in 1812 are number one, Russia not abiding by the continental system, number two, Russian worries of a Polish state, and number three, Napoleon's annexing of the Duchy of Oldenburg. So, Napoleon must wage a war with Russia to bring them back under control. The underrated aspect of this decision is Napoleon's health. After many campaigns of conquest, his health is starting to slip, and Napoleon wants to wage this war that he sees as inevitable with Russia while he's still physically able to to cement his dominance from Madrid to Moscow. Now that we have covered why Russia and France were in conflict in 1812, let's go into Napoleon's prep and planning for war with Russia. For starters, there's a myth that Napoleon discounted the challenges of invading Russia. Well, it's not exactly true. He planned very meticulously for this offensive, obsessing over even small particular details. The overarching plan was a three-week punitive expedition. They would launch their attack in June of 1812, meet the Russian army in a decisive battle near Vilnius, crush them, which would then force Alexander back to the treaty table, where Napoleon could impose his demands, forcing Russia to submit to his will. To execute this plan, Napoleon would raise the largest army in human history, with troops from 20 different nations. In the end, the total force would amount to roughly 640,000 troops. The reasons behind Napoleon's desire for such a massive army from a multitude of nations were twofold. Number one, to intimidate Alexander and showcase to him the massive might at Napoleon's disposal and the uselessness of resistance. Number two, to assert control over allies. Napoleon was always worried his allies would not stay loyal and by forcing them on this campaign, he could continue his iron grip on reluctant allies like Austria or Prussia. In order to raise this massive army, Napoleon needed not just troop commitment from allies, but also had to utilize France's impressive bureaucracy to conscript men. Roughly 140,000 out of the 640,000 were raw recruits. But the recruits were not just brought in for the Russian campaign. They were also used to replace some of the experienced troops he had to pull out of Spain for his Russian invasion. Those French troops in Spain were the best available to Napoleon in 1812, especially when compared to raw recruits thrust to the battlefield from the countryside. That's why, even though this was certainly Napoleon's largest army, it was far from his best. Those 140,000 raw recruits were of little use in battle, instead only suited to escort duty or guarding communication lines. As well, the army was so mixed that only 350,000 were even French. Roughly half were from other nations and regions, and only six of the 11 corps were French. Some regions provided very high quality troops, like Poland, but places like Naples or Italy had trouble providing first-rate troops after losing so many men in the Spanish campaign. This type of large, multinational army is nothing like Napoleon's previous armies. In 1805, 15% of his troops were foreign. By 1809, that number was up to 28%. The Grand Armée boosted that number up to 48%. Like I said, quality was definitely an issue with these troops, but also motivation was. 
For example, Polish troops were highly motivated to fight their traditional rival, Russia, and possibly regain Ukraine to the Duchy of Warsaw. However, troops from the Germanic states had little interest to fight in the name of Napoleon's empire. Gone was the homogeny of early campaigns. However, even if these troops were highly motivated, there was an acute issue of structure. By building an army of this size, Napoleon drastically changed formation sizes. For example, his battalions now grew over to 1,000 troops. Battalions are usually around roughly 400 men in size. But why do bigger battalions even matter? Well, the bigger the formation, the harder it is to direct in combat. Remember, this is the age before wireless communication. So for commanders, it's incredibly difficult to skillfully and quickly move large bodies of troops on the field. Maneuverability was a staple of Napoleon armies of the past. He believed deeply in the war of movement, using flexible, agile columns to operate independently of each other. Then, when they met the enemy, Napoleon could swing them together and concentrate his forces like a fist. Another side effect of these large formations is the breakup of experienced veteran units. Napoleon needed to help out his inexperienced, newly raised battalions. So he took veterans from experienced units and sprinkled them into those inexperienced ones to help guide them. The problem is that this eliminated those battle-hardened units who had worked so well together over the past years. Napoleon also does not have the commanders with the experience or the ability to direct formations of this size. Back in 1805, he basically had a dream team of marshals he could rely on, including Davou, Lennes, Soult, and Messina. Don't crush me for my bad French pronunciation. I'm trying. But for this campaign, only Davou was left. Lennes had died, Soult was needed to be kept in Spain, and Messina was now in disgrace. So he was stuck with marshals in which he had very little faith in their ability to operate independently, guiding formations larger than whole armies of past campaigns. As well, the plan of operation for this campaign was radically different from what had made France the dominant power on the continent. Like I said, Napoleon's armies won through a war of movement, concentrating their mass at the point of attack. Formations would pack light and live off the land, making the local population pay to support his army in the field. However, when going into Russia, Napoleon knew that the barren landscape would not be able to support his army, especially one this large. Sure, there are plenty of roads in Russia, but they're pretty much of terrible quality. So Napoleon plans to set up a large baggage train with a supply depot system. This will secure logistical support for his advance. And in the end, Napoleon is really only planning for a three week long punitive expedition, not a long campaign. For this baggage train and campaign to work, Napoleon will need horses. He brings together roughly 150,000 to 200,000. Sources kind of vary on that. With also 30,000 wagons. The majority of those horses will be used for the cavalry. Many are also needed to pull artillery and supplies needed to support this large army in the field. With all this planning and preparation, how didn't Napoleon expect Russia to not engage him? Well, to be honest, he kind of did. Napoleon did consider that the Russian commander, Barclay, would withdraw from Vilnius and retreat east. But he figured he could catch the Russian army at Smolensk and give battle there. Smolensk was an important Russian holy city, and there was no way they would let him get that far east without giving him a battle. Napoleon has no plans to go further east than Smolensk. The main issue, though, is the size of Napoleon's Grand Armée. Napoleon is attempting to guide three sprawling armies of a combined might of over 600,000 troops stretched over a front longer than 400 miles, hoping to concentrate at a single point in unison. It's Herculean in its complexity and ambition. And what of the invasion route Napoleon chooses? For his advance, he has two options. The impassable Pripyat marshes separate the two possibilities. The southern route is more fertile land, which would help feed and provide for his army. However, Napoleon chooses the barren northern route. Why? Well, two reasons, one political and one military. The northern route led through what is today Lithuania, which is likely to be very welcoming, having shared heritage with the Polish people of the Duchy of Warsaw. On the military side, by going north, he will split up the two Russian armies, dividing Barclay's army in the north with Bagradins, which is just north of the Pripyat marshes, while cutting those armies off from St. Petersburg. Further south, Napoleon will keep the Austrian force there to protect his southern flank against the Russian army released from the Turkish front. And so, Napoleon begins his invasion of Russia on June 24th, 1812, in the summer, not the winter, like is sometimes said. But before we get into the actual invasion, what of the Russians? A lot has talked about Napoleon and his failure during this campaign, but what about Alexander and his generals? What did they do to prepare for this invasion? For starters, they had three key advantages going into conflict preparations. Number one, Alexander never truly believed in the alliance. 
which helped Russia start preparing since their loss at Friedland. Number two, plan for a defensive war. Alexander and the Russian leading class knew that if they went on the offensive against Poland, that would alienate Prussia and Austria, who both had interest in that region. However, by having Napoleon attack first, they would not provoke those two. As well, they could use their strength to trade space for time, drawing Napoleon further and further away from his base of support. And number three, disentangled from other wars. Before the conflict with Napoleon, Russia had been involved with wars against Sweden and the Ottoman Turks, which kept sizable units tied up in those regions. However, by the time of the summer of 1812, those two conflicts had been ended, and Russia could concentrate all of its might on the Grand Armée. Napoleon, on the other hand, still had sizable troops tied up in Spain against Wellington's forces. Russia also learned from their previous losses to Napoleon, instituting key reforms. In artillery, this meant rigorous exams for officers and intersplicing artillery within line formations, like Napoleon did. For infantry, they moved away from the reliance on the bayonet charge and towards more focus on target practice, although there was still a sizable portion of Russian military thinkers who preferred the bayonet charge over the madness of the musket ball. Barclay had studied French military tactics and looked to adapt them to Russian forces, utilizing column formations within dispersed line formations to help with maneuverability. This also meant more of an emphasis on light infantry, with more mobility being added to the Russian army. Quality of life for soldiers was also improved upon since 1807, leading to better provisions, barracks, and less physical punishment. As well, Russia worked on improving their firearms industry, although it never really reached anything close to the level of France or Britain. Finally, and most importantly for the campaign to come, Russia altered its conscription model. Before 1808, Russian conscripts were sent from their farms straight to their fighting units. However, after 1808, they would first train for nine months in the new reserve recruit depots. These peasants would then have time to adapt to military life and train in military techniques. A more efficient and effective depot system meant that as the campaign progressed, Russia could replace its losses with trained manpower reserves, while Napoleon's forces, far from friendly territory, could not make up losses in manpower. Above all, you must remember, Russia was fighting for their survival. When Alexander addressed the nation to his people, he portrayed it as a crusade against a godless enemy, bent on the destruction of Russia and its people. Russian soldiers and citizens had a high motivation to expel this foreign invader from their soil. Diplomacy can make or break a campaign before it even begins. In the case of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, some key deals were made before the campaign commenced. I've already mentioned how Alexander freed up Russia from its entanglements against Sweden and the Ottoman Empire, but how that came about, and the repercussions of those moves, helped bring about the end of the Napoleonic Empire. We'll start with Sweden. For years, under King Gustavus, Sweden had been an active member in the coalitions against Napoleon. He hated the ideals of the French Revolution, and did not like Napoleon gaining influence further north, closer to the Swedish possession of Pomeria. But with Tilsit, Sweden was left precariously without allies on the continent, and one of the few nations not sucked into Napoleon's continental system. He preferred to keep siding with Britain rather than Napoleon, who he saw as the Antichrist. Then Great Britain bombed Copenhagen in Denmark. The British did this because they were worried Denmark was moving closer to France and was becoming an ally with them. Then Napoleon could use the Danish Navy against Great Britain, or Denmark would be able to cut off British access to the Baltic. The bombing of Copenhagen had huge repercussions. For starters, it pushed Denmark to be a sturdy ally of France until the end of the Napoleonic Wars. As well, it enraged Tsar Alexander of Russia. He felt the English were trying to assert dominance over the Baltic, which was a key Russian area of strategic influence, and really its only way to access international trade. Alexander demanded that Sweden close its ports to all foreign warships. Gustavus declined, and war began over what is today Finland. Why this matters in the context of the Napoleonic invasion of Russia is the ripple effect it caused. That war led to Russia taking over Finland, and ultimately a coup in Sweden which brought down Gustavus's reign. Sweden now needs a new ruler, and unfortunately their first choice dies unexpectedly. With uncertainty lurking, they want someone experienced in political and military matters to help Sweden recover its position. They settled on a man named Bernadotte, a former French marshal who had served under Napoleon, although the two didn't exactly see eye to eye to put it politely. Sweden asked Napoleon if he'll allow Bernadotte to be released from his oath to France and become king of Sweden. Napoleon agrees, hoping Bernadotte will stay loyal to France and help Sweden align with French interests. However, Bernadotte realized that his best chance at succeeding in Sweden is to put Swedish interests first and not to prioritize French needs. 
Part of that realization is giving up on acquiring Finland, instead focusing Sweden's territorial goals west towards modern-day Norway, which at the time was part of Denmark, who was a devoted ally of France, pushing Sweden to align itself against Napoleon. With that, Bernadotte assures Alexander that he will make no move on Finland in the event of Napoleon invading Russia, which frees Russia up not to keep troops there tied down protecting that flank. On the Russians' other flank is the war with the Ottoman Turks. That also ties down a sizable number of troops. However, once again, skillful diplomacy ended that war in May of 1812, right before Napoleon's invasion in June. And guess who helped secure that deal? The British, helping plant the seeds of the eventual Sixth Coalition. Finally, on to the actual invasion of Russia itself, and what went wrong for Napoleon. The Grand Armée was deployed in three formations. The main force had over 200,000 and was under Napoleon's direction. The left flank would be guarded by the Prussian force, while the right flank was anchored by the Austrians. Napoleon also had an extra 100,000 in reserve behind his main force. At the beginning of the invasion, Russia had just over 200,000 to face the Grand Armée. The largest force was under Barclay, in the north, followed by Bagration's 48,000 just south. However, with Russian strategic threats in the north by Sweden, in the south by the Ottoman Turks, eased, an additional 60,000 troops are freed up to assist. Napoleon's army entered Russia with the plan to destroy Barclay's army at Vilnius, then swing south, and crush Bagratin's forces there, then he could dictate terms to Alexander. Russia frustrated this plan immediately though, retreating once the invasion began. Their plan was to trade space for time, and avoid a decisive engagement while sucking Napoleon deeper and deeper into Russia. They also employed a scorched earth policy, destroying anything in their retreat that Napoleon might use to aid his army. From the beginning, the flaw of utilizing such a large force was evident. Command and control was extremely limited. Napoleon's forces were too big and spread too far to effectively concentrate them on any one point in a timely manner especially with more mobile Russian forces retreating before them. As well, Napoleon's depot system to supply his army, while looking good on paper, suffered in practice. Bad roads and summer storms hampered the supply wagons from reaching the advancing army. Even worse for Napoleon, his army had a high rate of raw conscripts, who were not used to long marching, and steadily started falling out of the invasion force, whether by exhaustion or desertion. By the end of July, Napoleon had advanced his army 250 miles into Russia. The campaign had already gone further and longer than he had planned or hoped. The summer exacted an excruciating toll. Without even fighting a major battle, the army had already suffered 20% casualties. Illnesses like typhus and dysentery were of particular problems. The suffering wasn't just reserved for men though, but also horses. At this point, they were losing roughly a thousand horses a day from exhaustion and lack of food. Horses were not just used for cavalry, but also very important for pulling the wagons of the supplies for the Grand Armée. Speaking of cavalry though, there is some important context to know about cavalry and how it was used during the Napoleonic era. When we think of cavalry now, we think of the brave and epic charges to secure a victory on the battlefield. However, that was not really their main role. The two key roles that cavalry played were screening and scouting. When an army was on a campaign, you used your cavalry to scout ahead and locate the enemy forces. Hard to defeat the enemy if you don't know where he is. As well, generals used cavalry to screen their own movements fighting off enemy cavalry units so that your opposition is blind to your movements. Cavalry could also raid supply and communication lines, but nothing was more pivotal than screening and scouting. Knowing where your enemy is, and consequently preventing him from knowing where you are, gives a force a decisive advantage. Napoleon's loss of horses severely hampered his intelligence, especially as he went further and further into Russia. Now we get to the key battle of Smolensk. This was a historic Russian holy city in the furthest point Napoleon had even considered marching his army. He's growing concerned about his long overexposed supply and communication lines, but believes this is finally his opportunity to fight a decisive battle that he has so long wanted. By the start of the battle, his troop strength is down to 182,000. But why did Russia fight here? Why not continue their plan of retreat? Well, this is the part of history that isn't talked about much during the 1812 invasion. The retreat strategy was not unanimously popular in Russian military circles. It is against what generals are wired to do. They want to be the ones on the offensive, being proactive instead of reactive. Retreating without giving battle is against their honor. As well, the Russian army's morale is plummeting. Soldiers are giving up their homeland to Napoleon without a fight. So, Alexander pushes Barclay to give battle. During the battle, Barclay fears he is about to be encircled in order to retreat leaving behind a burning Smolensk. Both sides lost roughly 10,000 casualties each. However, it was not a decisive battle, and Napoleon must make a decision to keep pursuing Russian forces, or should he turn around and go home? For Napoleon, he can't stomach the idea of being seen as being defeated. 
entering Russia and leaving without destroying their army. Other nations might see this and be emboldened to do the same as Russia and resist him. Napoleon must defeat this army, and so he goes deeper and deeper into the abyss. Napoleon also feels that if he continues towards Moscow, the traditional Russian capital, that the Russians will have to give him battle. There is no way they can give up that city without a fight. This leads us to one of the bloodiest battles of the Napoleonic Wars, Borodino. Before this battle, Alexander made a change, bringing in General Kutuzov to take command of the Russian armies above Barclay. During this epic clash, twice Napoleon's army had the Russian army reeling in their center on the verge of collapse. But Napoleon decided against putting his last reserve into the fight. Some accounts talk of Napoleon's exhaustion and illness taking an effect, but the simple fact is that Napoleon was worried that if he threw his last reserve into the fight, his army would not be able to fight again if they encountered another Russian force in the coming days or weeks. Here is the fundamental conundrum Napoleon put himself in. He wants a decisive battle to decide the campaign in a single blow. And yet, because of how deep he is in Russia, a decisive battle where he throws everything into it is just too risky. So the Russian army escaped again. The losses in this battle were appalling. Russia lost roughly 40,000, while France lost around 30,000. After the battle, Russian forces fell back to regroup, refit, and reinforce their army, abandoning Moscow to Napoleon. On September 14th, he entered Moscow. The goal for Napoleon now turns to negotiation, offering Alexander to make peace and end the war. Here is when we get another misconception about the Russian invasion. The traditional interpretation is that Napoleon dithered in Moscow for six weeks, which is not fundamentally true. It is true that militarily, he would have been better off leaving Moscow after two weeks, rather than six. But he took Moscow for the purpose of diplomatic reasons. And so if he left after two weeks, that would have left him only a tiny window to negotiate with Alexander. On the backdrop of Napoleon's enter into Moscow is the Moscow Fire, which has some conflicting origins. Was it a carefully planned scorch earth policy or just a lucky accident? Most likely it was a little bit of both, at first started by an accident during the Russian evacuation, then further amplified after the governor general of Moscow freed Russian criminals and then had them cause even more damage with fires. By October, Napoleon made his decision that he must abandon Moscow. Alexander wasn't engaging with his diplomatic appeals and the fires had caused so much damage that they couldn't possibly shelter the army there for winter. As well, the long supply and communication lines were constantly being harassed by Russian Cossacks or cavalry. At this point is another key turning point. For the first time in the campaign, Napoleon's main army is now outnumbered. After Borodino, he had roughly 100,000 men left, while Russia was able to get their strength up to 110,000. The Russians could also draw from their conscript depot system and continue to raise the size of their forces. Napoleon has no ability to reinforce the losses from the last four months. The Russian army is well supplied and rested, while Napoleon's is exhausted and reeling. Leaving Moscow, Napoleon has two routes he can take one south through the unspoiled fertile lands of modern-day Ukraine, or he can go back the way he came through Borodino and Smolensk. The issue with going south, though, is he risks another direct engagement with the rested and reinforced Russian army, which may lead to his destruction. So Napoleon chooses the safer route back the way he came. The problem with going back the way they came is that the region had very few provisions the first time they went through it, and now it has been picked clean and will have nothing to help aid the army in its retreat. There's another far-fetched route going straight from Moscow to St. Petersburg, which was the surest way to get Alexander to fight, but it was impossible. It would have meant marching through barren, forested, and uncharted terrain with an already greatly weakened Grand Armée. So on October 19th, the Grand Armée made its perilous retreat. The Lumbering Beast is a column 10 miles long and is wildly overloaded with the spoils taken from Moscow. Russian forces harass them the whole way to Smolensk, and then the flanks of Napoleon's invasion line start to rupture. After six weeks, they made it to Smolensk, their planned winter shelter. But just as they entered Smolensk, the Russians took the key supply depot at Vitebsk. Now winter was settling in and snow was starting. The French forces were without winter supplies and have lost a third of their forces since they left Moscow. Desperation is taking over the army, but supplies they do have at Smolensk are raided by the first troops who enter the city, leaving nothing for the follow-up troops. Napoleon realizes he can't stay here. He must head for Minsk, which is a major supply depot, with vast quantities of food, clothing, shoes, and ammo they desperately need. His force is now roughly 45,000, outnumbered 3 to 1. It is November 9th. As Napoleon's broken army continues west, the worst possible news occurs. Minsk falls on November 21st. It is now a race to escape the three Russian armies collapsing in around him. The Grand Armée barely escapes across the Berezina River, 
creating pontoon bridges just in the nick of time. In the 43 days since leaving Moscow, they have covered 500 miles. Napoleon is down to just 20,000 effectives, with an additional 20,000 stragglers. But they have somehow made it to Vilna. Here is where Napoleon leaves his Grand Armée. A coup attempt was made back in Paris, and he must go back to reassert his control and raise a new army. Marshal Ney takes the remnants of the once Grand Army across the Nyman River and into friendly Polish territory, sealing the end of one of the greatest military disasters in history. In all, the Grand Armée lost 375,000 dead and another 100,000 captured, while Russia lost roughly 150,000. In total, more troops were lost due to the effects of the Russian heat on the initial advance than were lost in the chaotic retreat during the Russian winter. He lost more than just men, though. Napoleon lost over 920 out of his 1,300 cannons, and his cavalry was annihilated, with roughly 200,000 horses dead in the Russian countryside. Napoleon could replace men. That is how he was able to raise armies to fight in the spring of 1813 in German lands, and then again after his return from Elba for the Battle of Waterloo in the summer of 1815. But what he could never replace after 1812 was the loss of horses and cannons. It takes roughly two years to train horses for combat, and he has ransacked France of all the horses that he could before invading Russia. As for the cannons, it takes time and resources to mass-produce cannons. With the Sixth Coalition bearing down on him, time and resources were two things Napoleon did not have. These two elements would not recover, and would play a key role in Napoleon's eventual defeat from the spring of 1813 to early 1814. The story of the Russian winter defeating Napoleon didn't take long to take hold, but it doesn't have much merit. In fact, contemporary data from meteorological stations reveal the winter of 1812 was actually pretty mild until late November. But by that time, Napoleon's army had already been defeated. The winter effect simply put the final nail in the Grand Armée's coffin. In the end, what destroyed Napoleon's army was a variety of factors. Just because it was large doesn't mean it was truly powerful. Years of campaigns and battles, especially in Spain, whittled away a lot of the best troops Napoleon had. And in his desire to overawe Alexander, he collected troops from a variety of different nations and regions that had no strong desire to be fighting Russia. As well, with such a large hulking beast of an army, it eliminated Napoleon's greatest strength of previous campaigns, mobility. In the past, Napoleon used semi-independent columns moving quickly and freely, living off the land of their enemy, then concentrating their mass at the point of contact with the enemy. Instead, this campaign would be spread across a broad front with massive formations using a supply depot system to sustain the army. Napoleon sacrificed speed and maneuverability for raw numerical strength. However, his plan never accounted for a Russian strategy that refused to give him battle, as they marched across Russian lands, trading space for time. Napoleon made a tragic error in planning in this respect. The punitive expedition he planned so meticulously went up in flames as his army had to march further and further across the scorched earth land devoid of substance. And ironically, once he finally got his chance for a possible decisive battle, he was too overstretched in far from friendly territory to risk his army. In the end, the Russian campaign helped to bring about the end of Napoleon's empire. But it was not alone in that. The Spanish conflict was basically Napoleon's Vietnam, having been fought for the last four years before he ever invaded Russia in 1812. And even after the Russian campaign, he managed to raise another army and try to defend the German lands. He could have abandoned Germany and solidified a strong, defendable line along the Rhine River. Instead, he chose to defend his hard-won German states and tried to block the Sixth Coalition at the Elbe River. That stubbornness led him to battles at Dresden and Leipzig, and ultimately towards the fall of France to the Sixth Coalition. That's what really ended the Napoleonic Empire. The inability to stop or accept the loss of control. Napoleon won his empire and maintained it by force. He famously said his regime could not suffer even the loss of a single battle. In that light, it's not surprising it all came crashing down. A regime that can only sustain itself by conquest is doomed to fail. The further it extends, the more pain points it creates for itself, until eventually the House of Cards will just blow over in one final epic disaster, much like Napoleon's did in Russia.